Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, continuing our verse by verse study through the entire New Testament this series, which is a change of pace because normally I go from Genesis through Revelation. But this time, just the New Testament, and we come today to Acts chapter 9, and we left off in verse 4 last time. So, as always, if you can, get your Bible, and we'll begin in Acts chapter 9 in just a minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is a website that you need to know about. If you love God's Word, if you're hungry for God's Word, then you probably want to check it out because you can study with me three complete series going through the Bible, verse by verse, just exactly the way we're going to do it today. And uh, there, all you have to do is click on this series, the book, the chapter, and listen and follow along in your Bible, which is the only thing that you need to bring to the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Okay, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin our reading in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why per persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the goads. Jesus did not pull any punches. He said, Saul, you are persecuting me. He confronted Saul with his sin in order to wake him up so that he might change his ways. The straight word of God will encourage us in the things that we are doing right, and it will confront us over the things that we are doing wrong. But either way, we need to have the word of God taught clearly without watering it down in any part. Verse 6, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Saul, with his face in the dust, humbly asks the Lord Jesus Christ what he wants him to do. He had a lot of pride, but it's all gone in the presence of Jesus. And that will be true of all hardcore sinners, tough guys, tough women, who are proud and arrogant about their sin. Let me tell you that the hardest the toughest, hardcore sinners tremble when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and there will be no exceptions. 7. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. Saul, who had nothing but hatred for the Son of God, is now blind and confused. 
He was blind and he will stay blind for a while. And that will give him time to reflect on his past sin. Nine. And he was there three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. So Saul is suddenly engulfed in guilt and fear and darkness, and it lasted three days. Three days by himself, heavy laden with guilt, fear, and darkness. He sat alone in darkness, wondering what was going to happen next because he had no promise of forgiveness or healing. For all he knows, that room that he has been in for three days may be where he stays until he dies. He had been filled with hatred and sinful pride. Sin had permeated every cell in his body. And so the removal of that sin demands a holy terror and anguish that also permeates every single cell in his body. The deeper one allows sin to become ingrained in their life, the deeper God has to dig to remove it, which means more intense pain. 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Ananias receives a direct revel revelation from God. He's a Christian. And he happens to be in Damascus. And if, and if Saul would have found him earlier, before this happened to him, he would have been one that Saul put in chains and dragged back to Jerusalem for prosecution. So he's sitting in Jerusalem, or I should say he's sitting in Damascus, and he has a direct revelation from God. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And any command probably would have been more appealing to Ananias than go meet with Saul. Christians knew who Saul was. Christians knew that he was, he was a rabid, wild animal, a wild beast when it came to Christians. Which is why I said Ananias probably would have preferred any command other than go meet with this man by the name of Saul, sometimes God's will for his people makes them extremely uncomfortable and even fearful. Don't discount something that comes into your life or that is looming as not being God's will simply because it makes you uncomfortable or fearful. 11 and 12. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias probably thought, Well, at least Saul is praying. That's maybe some consolation. That might be a good sign. At least God seems to be dealing with Saul, the Christian killer. 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. In other words, in other words, Ananias thinks that he has to fill God in on the facts surrounding Saul. You know, maybe you were not aware of this, Lord, but he's been nothing but trouble for Christians 
Thought I would just tell you that in case you didn't know that. It's funny how Christians are going through difficult times, often feel that they have to explain the situation to God as if he didn't, as if he didn't know what was going on. 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Saul the Christian killer, Saul that Jesus hater, is destined to become a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of all people, Saul by far, far and away, was the most unlikely candidate to become a Christian and on fire preacher of Jesus Christ. Which is why people who do not believe that Jesus is the risen Lord have a hard time explaining the sudden reversal in Saul. With no one but Jesus himself instructing him, Saul went from being a Christian hater to a Christian proclaimer. Verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Jesus is calling the shots. And he's not apologizing for it either. Never apologize for the word of God, even if it doesn't set well with this present culture that we're living in. Jesus is calling the shots and he's not apologizing for it. Jesus chose Saul to be saved. He chose Saul to serve him and he chose Saul to suffer for him and he doesn't feel the need to give an explanation either. The sooner we Christians understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign and therefore has the right to allow anything he wants to, to allow in our life, and to use us in any way that he sees fit and in any situation he chooses. The sooner we learn that Jesus Christ has the right to do those things, the better off we will be. 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias refers to Saul as his brother. Ananias does an amazing thing here, but it's the correct thing. He overlooks Saul's sinful past because Saul is now a Christian. Jesus forgives those who repent and receive him as Lord and Savior, and so should we. 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight and arose and was baptized. He was baptized before he did anything else. This, this verse once again stresses the importance of water baptism for those who have received Christ. We see water baptism stressed as being very important in the book of Acts. Verse 19. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Let's stop right there for a second. Notice how he was baptized even before he had anything to eat or drink. He hadn't eaten anything in three days. But the first thing he wanted to do was be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then he got something to eat. When a person is serious about the Lord Jesus Christ, obeying him becomes more important than things generally considered to be necessities in this world. 19 and 20. And when he had received food, he was strengthened then was Saul certain days with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Saul swallowed his pride, and instead of condemning Jesus to his fellow Jews, he started preaching Jesus to them. Acts 
Everyone makes mistakes. The important thing is to repent and get on the right track. And that's what Saul did. He started preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, which was also admitting that he had been dead wrong, very wrong in the past. He had been wrong with terrible consequences of being wrong. I mean, he raised havoc among Christians. So he really had to swallow his pride. But when you love truth, you'll do it. And you'll use it as a testimony to your love for the truth. And maybe it doesn't speak so highly of you because you are in essence admitting that you were dead wrong in the past. But on the other hand, you're humble enough to admit it. And that can be a powerful testimony that Jesus can use. 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them who called on his name in Jerusalem and came here for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? Isn't this the same guy? The amazed people. The amazed people here were not Christians because those talking about change, the change in Saul, referred to Christians in the third person. So they're not saved, but they see the difference in Saul. And so we see that non-Christians were amazed at the change that occurred in Saul. I mean, overnight, 180 degrees shift, just like that from an extreme Christian hater and Christ hater to an extreme Christ lover and preacher. And the people can't believe the change. 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt at Jerusalem, proving, or at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So Saul had the Jews fired up and confused. What's going on with Saul? They didn't understand his radical change in behavior, and they didn't understand his new interpretation of Scripture, which now favored Jesus either. 23. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So not everyone was impressed, nor were they influenced by Paul's Reversal concerning Christ. We get to choose our trouble. Receiving Jesus Christ will bring us plenty of trouble from God. I should say rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will bring us plenty of trouble from God on Judgment Day. Receiving Christ and living for Him in this ungodly world will give us plenty of trouble today. We get to choose our trouble. What's it going to be? Trouble with the world who doesn't like Jesus today or trouble with God beginning on Judgment Day? Saul chose trouble from the world rather than trouble from God. Smart choice. 23. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their lying in wait was known by Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So the governor turned Damascus into a military fortress in order to capture Saul. I mean, everybody was against him except for a few Christians and Jesus. And what a change. Because when Saul persecuted Christians, he was a hero. But now people are trying to kill him. Think about it. Saul did not make the switch because he was bored. Saul does not make that switch unless he is absolutely certain that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the only way to heaven, and the risen Lord who came back from the dead three days later. He doesn't make that switch and bring all this trouble on him overnight unless he is absolutely convinced that Jesus is the only Savior who died on the cross to pay for our sins and that Jesus is Almighty God and the only way to heaven. He doesn't make that switch. Why would he do that to bring all that trouble on himself? 
when he was a hero, now he is a fugitive with a death warrant on him. You don't make that switch unless you absolutely know it's true. And in, and in Saul's case, Jesus appear, appeared to him. You say, yeah, well, if that would happen to me, then I'd switch too. You don't, no, you wouldn't. If you don't switch at the testimony of God's word and repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior because of the testimony of God's word, you would not switch if Jesus appeared to you and said, I'm the risen Lord. You wouldn't switch. You would explain it away. Because if you if you explain away the written word of God, then you will explain away everything. Verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Hmm. Saul had faith to trust God. He put his trust in God. But he also used common sense. Jesus tells us Christians that if we live holy, then we will have tribulation in this world. But if we can avoid trouble without violating Scripture, then there sure isn't anything wrong with doing that. 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. You know, the Christians, the Christians in Jerusalem where Saul arrived had suffered a, an awful lot of persecution at the hands of this Saul. So they were suspicious. They weren't buying it. Maybe he was pretending to be a Christian. Maybe he was trying to trick them. But Saul proved that his faith was real by his willingness to suffer for Jesus. 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas was a kind person. He always seemed to give people the benefit of the doubt. When others didn't trust Saul, Barnabas stood by him. Barnabas type people sure are nice to have around when you need a friend, aren't they? And you can't seem to find one. 28. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So the Grecian Jews could not out-debate or out-reason Saul concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, so they decided to kill him. They, like many today, had a truth agenda. They wanted something to be true so badly that they disregarded all facts that contradicted it. We shouldn't care what truth is as long as we have the truth. 30. Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Saul escapes death again, and this time he returns to his hometown in Tarsus. 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. So the Jews, not just Saul, but the Jews as a whole left the Christians alone for a while. They stopped persecuting the Christians. They took a recess, as it were, and that's because they had too many other problems to contend with at that time. The Jews were too preoccupied with other problems to worry about Christians. For example, the emperor Caligula was trying to set up his image in the temple. And when the Jews protested, Rome made war with them. So they're dealing with stuff like that. And that's more critical 
at this point than Christians. So they left the Christians alone, and Christians have a momentary peace anyway. 32, and it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. And so we shift gear from Saul to Peter here in verse 32, and we see that Peter visits a church that Philip, remember Philip, the evangelist, had started earlier, 33. And there he found certain, a certain man named Aeneas, who had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy, which means he had no hope of ever walking again. 34. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee well. Arise and take thy bed. And he arose immediately. In other words, you're healed, Aeneas, so start acting like it. In Jesus' name, you're healed, now start acting like it. Get up and start walking. Not a bad suggestion for Christians today as well. Christ has declared that we have power over sin, so there's, there's no reason in the world for us to act like we are victims of sin any longer. 35. And all that dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. No other so-called God could do the things that Jesus was doing through his apostles. Consequently, those with honest hearts who were open to the truth believed the word of God and they received Christ. 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Tabitha was a wonderful Christian woman. There's no record that she ever said great things, but she certainly did great things. She was a giver. She gave her time and her money to the service of her Lord by helping people in his name. 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom, when they had washed, they laid in an upper chamber. So death was, was actually good news for Tabitha, but it was bad news for everyone who would miss her. People like Tabitha do not grow on trees. Generous people who are kind to those who need it are not commonplace. So she will be missed, and that's why people are mourning for her. In verse 38, and for as much as Lydda was near to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men declaring him that he would not delay to come to them, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. So these people, friends of, friends of Tabitha, knew the power of Jesus, and so they called for Peter. They're not willing to accept Tabitha's death, not without putting up a fight. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the windows stood, all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. She was a good person, very kind, a real servant. And that's why so many people care about her and don't want her to stay dead. The Bible says those who would have friends must show themselves friendly. She was friendly. She was kind. And people liked her because people like her are rare. We'll pick it up and uh, right here in verse 40 next time. So make sure you join me then. In the meantime, though, you can continue studying the Word of God with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click and listen to whatever book of the Bible, whatever chapter you want to study with me. Using my audio Bible commentaries, all you need to bring is your Bible. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember that if you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be by praying for me, praying for the Word, and clicking the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully giving as the Lord may lead. See you next time.